<laughs> so first off, I just want to thank everybody for coming out, um, especially the panelists, who I'll introduce formally in a second. And I especially want to thank Ryan and Rachel Roos. Ryan is the owner of this establishment um, of Zion's Books and Fine Art. He's not up. He's not back here right now. He's around somewhere, but I just I just want to give him acknowledgement. He and Rachel have done a beautiful job with this space, um, and it's part of a beautiful revitalization of downtown Provo that's happening. Um, we're going to have a short panel discussion. Um, we have three panelists that are each going to take five to eight minutes. Um, Nyland will get a chance to respond. And we can even throw in some audience Q&A at the end. And then we'll transition over to having Nyland sign copies of her books. You can ask her questions. And we'll have some light refreshments afterward. I want to introduce our panelists briefly and thank them again for coming. Um, we'll hear first from Camille Frank Olson. She's a well-known figure in church education and at Brigham Young University, currently serving as the department chair in religious education at BYU the author of Women of the Old Testament, and the forthcoming Women of the New Testament. I am extremely happy to have her here. Uh, I was just happy about the book. Oh, tell us more, please. Um, next we have Blair Van Dyke. We'll hear from him in a second. Blair's kind of an interesting combination. He's a combination of philosopher, church education guy, and Middle East specialist. So Blair teaches at the Utah Valley University LDS Institute. He also teaches philosophy at Utah Valley University. And he's also an expert on the LDS church in the Middle East, and in particular in Jerusalem. Um, also on Middle East matters in general, but he's actually done, published, and is still working on research on the church in the Middle East, on the church in Jerusalem in particular, um, and also has some forthcoming work on the translation of the Book of Mormon into modern Hebrew. So we're very lucky to have Blair with us as well. And then third, we will hear from Courtney Kendrick. Um, Courtney, some of you will probably know better by her online pseudonym if you read her blog. Courtney is also known as C. Jane. So um, Courtney is also, I think, probably a fan of this space because she has for some time now been uh, very devoted to downtown Provo. And... Uh, Help organize the rooftop concert series as well. So Courtney is a pro bowman through and through. Um, I assume all of you know who Nylon is. Nylon doesn't need an introduction, but I'm going to introduce her anyway. Um, she is, uh, her background is in marketing. She's a graduate of Yale University. She um, is a brand strategist, and um, she has been a longtime advocate of women in the church. And so she's the reason why we're here. Her book is the reason why, well, why we're here. And I now just want to turn the time over in LDS fashion to our panel. <laughs> Camille. Uh, well, it, it, I am truly honored to be able to respond to this remarkable contribution to LDS dialogue in uh, women's role in the church. Long overdue and Remark and it comes out in a very timely fashion. I just think it's going to start all kinds of conversations. Just quickly, um, background Brad asked me to read the, a digital copy of this um, and review it just as I was taking off for a two week vacation, and I wasn't able to download it until the flight home. I thought, oh, and it was due the next, the review was due the next day. I thought I would see what I could do on it on the flight home. I picked it up, started reading, and I could not put it down. I know Nile. I'm a fan of Nile. <laughs> I knew it would be good, but I was unprepared for just how good it is. It is smart. It is bold. It is faithful, very articulate and authentic, but it is also very practical. One thing I think it is so remarkable of what she's done, and it's quite unique in the sense that she has listened, and listened over a long period of time to a large cross-section of members of the church. Women with all different kinds of perspectives and feelings about their role 
in the church, priesthood leaders, and their different experiences and expectations for women's role. She hasn't censured, she hasn't preached, she's listened. And just from one of those women in the church, not that she, I gave her my feedback, but as a woman in the church, I could just say, that doesn't happen very often, or not much in my experience. And so for just that, I say thank you, Nyland, for listening and not jumping to conclusions before you hear people, women and men, throughout the church, all around the world. Um, second, without trying to change any current church structure, she has looked at where we are right now in the church. She highlights what's in the handbook of instruction and what we have by way of history in the church and starts opening up my mind and I think anyone who reads this, what the possibilities are for expanding the viable contributions and visibility of LDS women in public ways in the church. I think very often um, we hear of the contributions and the need and the power of women in relief society. And as we lead relief society and all the women of the church, we hear about what the, the place and the power of women in the temple. But by and large, the world doesn't see women in those places. I couldn't help but think about Nyland's book, Just in My Ward on Sunday. And I think this was unusual for my ward. But I looked in the sacrament meeting in my ward, and with the exception of the chorister and the organist, everyone else who participated in every single way was a man. And it just happened to be that way, but it was, I thought if I was visiting and trying to hear what we as Latter-day Saints, and what I try to say, we women have power in the church, and you came to my ward on Sunday, it might not be so clear. And I think there's something about Nyland's book that would help those who organize every sacrament meeting to ask the question, where are the women? And what are they doing? I love Nyland's contributions. They are specific uh, suggestions of what could women could do. And I, it's just been a couple of weeks, but I've already um, started trying to implement them. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, I'm the Laurel advisor in my ward, but I watch as our young men in my ward pass the sacrament and prepare the sacrament and pass the microphone around on past Sunday. I also see them as they're at the door greeting people and handing out programs. So after reading this book, the dial makes this suggestion, why couldn't young women sacrament meeting and hand out the programs. Young men are dashing around all over and the young women come in and they sit and they watch. So I talked to my laurels, would you, you know, what do you think? Would you like to do that? Well, they looked up like, what a novel idea. Yeah. So I mentioned it to the, to the young women president. She wasn't quite as enthused about it as I was. <laughs> So I didn't let it sit there. I ran into one of the counselors of the bishopric, and I said, hey, what do you think? And he said, you know, we're always scrambling. That's a good idea. Now, I don't know what's happened yet, but I'm going to follow through on it. She mentioned some other things that I'm telling you, in my, I have never seen a woman participate in any way in a baby lesson. She gave some ideas that I'm thinking, wait a minute. It's so easy to think about the way traditionally we have done things. How often, I didn't know, but I've talked to people, how often <laughs> mothers come and sit with their baby in the center of the circle while the baby is being blessed. Um, why not? Why not? And um, a, a score of other wonderful opportunities. Um, I think one of the geniuses of Nyland's approach 
she encourages priesthood leaders and women to together discover solutions um, and find ways of more fully appreciating the talents, contributions, and voices of every member of every congregation. Um, most of all, as I read this book, I, as an LDS woman, felt heard and understood and represented. I can't help but think that every woman in the church, no matter what their backgrounds, would feel the same. It would be, it will do much to help heal some of the divisions that I have sensed occurring between women, LDS women. I've heard way too many LDS women say, oh, those women who want the priesthood, what are they thinking? And not hearing where the pain is, where they have felt marginalized. This book can help those who haven't had those questions and, and felt that pain to hear and understand and sympathize, even though they may not empathize completely with what they have felt. Um, I celebrate Nyland's courage, her boldness. Thank you so much. It's the beginning of great conversations, and I truly believe changes that will occur for the betterment of men and women and children in the LDS faith. Thank you. Uh, I am honored, to say the least, to be here. And uh, thanks to the organizers for the invitation and privilege to be here with you. Um, I uh, also very much enjoyed the book, and uh, Nyland's approach is both cooperative and conciliatory, and in the conciliation there is not a forfeiture of essential ground. Um, there is conciliation within cooperation. And uh, she's not working from a deficiency model. In other words, this is what I, this is what I'm lacking. Why don't you give me this? It's uh, it's it's a fullness model wherein this is what we have. Let's see what, how we can embellish it in different ways. What we already enjoy. Uh, and so the tone is very very constructive. Uh, nobody's recovering from the Benson years, if you will, in this particular book. <laughs> uh, a phrase that I have heard many times. And um, that might be an interesting discussion to have, but it's not within the pages of this book. Uh, Island appeared to be, and then did, construct a different edifice. That was fascinating to me. Um, I would turn the page and anticipate a potential tone shift. It just never shifted. And I genuinely appreciated the constructiveness. Um, I very much enjoy the exposure for the reader, the readers, and many people are going to read this book, I think, to the foundational texts that are essential uh, to understanding <clears throat> women in Mormonism. And so the, the multiple references to the beginning of Better Days, the Relief Society Minutes and the Joseph Smith Papers, which Claudia Bushman has recently suggested uh, ought to be considered for canonization. Uh, and then quoting from those minutes, very productive and moving the reader, not to Nyland, but to 
the Joseph Smith Papers project and to the, the original foundational documents themselves. That's a very responsible, um, appreciated reproach, approach uh, in, uh, in my estimation. Um, very enjoyable. So Women of the Covenant and uh, Women of Faith in the Latter Days. New websites have been established that uh, she points the reader to. Uh, introducing the Latter-day reader, Latter-day Saint reader, to names that may not be familiar to your general Deseret book readership, where the, the life of a book may be something in the neighborhood from a marketing perspective of, of something like eight weeks, maybe 12 weeks. All right, the Jill multi Durs don't operate in that 12 week marketing realm. And, and so you come to, as, as a result of reading, you come to be introduced to uh, Jill Mulvey Durr and Laurel Thatcher Ulrich and uh, Karen Lynn Davidson, Fiona Givens, and so forth. I very much enjoyed and appreciated the uh, encouragement of crossover instruction within church instruction. Elders Corps presidents being instructed by Relief Society leaders, young men and young women leaders, um, trading um, instructional roles, etc. Uh, it connotes and suggests a very fruitful field to be plowed and harvested that is yet ahead of us. While much is good behind us, uh, Again, the tone of the recommendations in the text of Women at Church suggests much lies ahead of us. And I won't spoil the ending. <laughs> <laughs> that the last page may lean in that direction, but uh, not surprisingly. Um, I thought it was uh, particularly <clears throat> helpful that Nylon treated the subject of women's harshness to women. Um, that being a man I find that an ongoing aspect of fascination and I know that uh, within gender theory that may simply be the outgrowth of different patriarchal structures that, that women are within within particular societies and yet addressing it and discussing it the way it's discussed in this book is helpful and may allow and provide avenues for discussion between men and women and between women and women uh, that could be particularly helpful. I would have been very interested in, uh, and this is from a male perspective, um, a little more treatment on men who are anxious to assist and who are very open to uh, more expansive roles for uh, opening up those doors that haven't been opened to women and, um, and women pushing back against the very men who might be part of the solution and not the problem. And, uh, and so as Camille echoes, how many times are we going to hear about this women ordaining of the priesthood? As a man, I am also prone to hear when I suggest uh, something that would seem fantastically liberal, like a woman participating in some way, shape, or form in a baby blessing. It's not the men that take shots. As a general rule of thumb, it's the women. And that would have been fascinating. Maybe we can talk about that in, our, in, in, the, in the panel. Uh, because, again, maybe you would view that as an outgrowth of patriarchy. Uh, I'm not sure. I very much appreciate the fact that within the book you de-vilified Julie B. Beck. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there were a few years where this leader in Mormonism 
did not get a great deal of positive press from females. And uh, Julie Beck stands tall in this work, and I think history will stand behind your assessment. And I will leave it there. Uh, but I think that was bold and uh, appreciated as I read. I, was, I enjoyed that. Um, I, like Camille, I enjoyed your recommendations that that revolve around Harold B. Lee's scaffolding of the church, not the soul of the church. Acknowledging the handbook, uh, there wasn't a wrestling match over how postmodern could Nalen get in this book. Um, she was willing to work within the established order of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. So it's a unique intellectual endeavor to read this book, and then it's a unique devotional undertaking to read this book. And in that regard, the book is unique. All right? And in that regard, it will likely ruffle feathers, and in that regard, it will likely thrill people. I, for one, found it very refreshing to find a devotional merging with um, very intellectually challenging approach to a complex issue, a series of issues. Um, I'm not, I'm just supposed to be kicking me, so I got <laughs> I told you, Camille, time to kick me. I could go on, uh, but I appreciate um, Nalen's work here in this piece. It's a very uh, timely contribution. Courageous contribution. Thank you. I'm, I'm going to stand up because when I try to talk really loud, I sound like a hyena. So, at the risk of hurting everybody's ears, um, I one of the things that I appreciate most about this book was the personal stories, and um, it's it sounds like. And I've read a million of them. And um, because of that, I, I wanted to share a little bit of my own as I talk about what this book meant to me to read it. Um, Brad mentioned that uh, I have been an advocate of downtown Provo. I grew up in Provo. And um, I, for that reason, I'm uh, an advocate of Provo. But also because I hope for change in Provo. And um, I hope for that because well, I had a great childhood here. There were some things that, that caused uh, some uh, sadness or loneliness um, in this experience. Some of you nodding your head. <laughs> um, I grew up in right across the street from BYU and um, with a great family and a, a great ward. Some of the greatest church scholars grew up and I mean, uh, raised their families in my ward, and I grew up with them. However, when I was 17 years old, and I was thinking about this today, I met Nyland in um, New York City when I was 17 years old. And when I was 17 years old, I firmly believed that I was less than the men that I knew in my life. I grew up really wondering why God didn't love me enough to make me a man. Now, it seems so silly, right? Because nobody said that to me. But that's just the clues that I got growing up here, maybe in Provo. And, and in our church and the family culture that I was in, I just felt like I'm going to do my best with the biology that God gave me, but I'm coming at a, a real um, disadvantage. And when I was 17 years old and met Nyland for the first time, I was desperate to get married and have children because I felt like it was the only way I was going to ever feel like I had achieved or, or reached my my potential as, as a LDS woman. Um, and of course, I don't know, maybe all of you have smooth sailing lives, but mine wasn't so much. I didn't really want to go on a mission because that meant that I wasn't married, right? But I went on a mission and um, had a wonderful time. And when I got back, I got married and had a failed first marriage. Got married again to a really great man, but for five years, we tried and tried to have babies and could not 
And all of these were reminders of, of, a, of a failure. I was failing to achieve that potential that I had already always hoped I was going to attain it someday. And it reminded me of this uh, paragraph. Can I read from here? I don't want to Please. spoil anything. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so now let's talk about single women, but I think it, it can apply to a lot of us who experience sort of a lack in the, in the general um, fulfillment of women's roles in the church. Single women can feel their identity in the church is defined by what they are not. They are not wives, they are not mothers. Even maintaining virtue, a, a, a revered spiritual char characteristic of a single woman can be perceived as merely an absence of sexual experience. They are what they lack. Is it any wonder single women in particular struggle with the feeling of being part of our community? kind of what I felt um, in my experience with infertility, that I was what I wasn't or what I couldn't do. And from, from that moment on, I, I uh, from experiencing the infertility until today, I think I decided that I was going to have to totally shift my paradigm and how I thought about being a Mormon woman. So when I read this book today, I read it today. <laughs> I, just, I wasn't going to say that, but I hear so many levels. Oh my gosh. Well, that just tells you how riveting it is. I read it one day. Um, but as I read it, I was thinking, this is a fulfillment of, 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 um, of everything that I, I wanted to say or I felt growing up. Um, this is something that I want to hand to the men in my life and the women in my life and say, please, please read this. And let's have discussions so that my daughters don't feel the same way that I felt. So that when they walk into sacrament meeting, it, their 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 um, gender isn't is it hasn't disappeared. And let's read it for the men, for, the, for my son, who uh, needs to understand that what it is. <clears throat> his imagination can expand on how to be a, a woman man. And um, I. I, I feel like I feel like we've touched on something here um, that is middle road. It's 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 not. I wouldn't call it safe. It's not a, exactly a safe book for everybody, but it's a it's a it's a solid middle middle ground, and I appreciate that as as one who's publicly um, come out in support of of the ordination. I think this is a, a good starting point where we can say. Let's just start here. Maybe ordination's down the road, and maybe it's not. But this is a great, great place to start. And Nyla, thank you so much. I know as a as a as a working mother, and uh, all that all that you do for the church. On top of that, to write a book like this is an incredible thing. And I thank you so much for it.
have helped me do that listening and have done a remarkable listening on their own. We have two interview producers here tonight. Chrisanne, would you raise your hand? And Rebecca, sitting in front of her there, have produced interviews for the Mormon Women Project, uh, which, as you may know, is a collection of interviews uh, with LDS women from around the world found at mormonwomen.com. And we've worked, we're close to 300 interviews at this time, and we'll be five years old in January. Um, I, I've had the wonderful editing help of Riley Lorimer from the Justice Smith Papers. Uh, I just entrusted her early on with just being at my side during this process, and she was wonderful. And then, of course, um, you know, nobody nobody looks at the book without at least thinking, if not saying out loud, how beautiful it is. And for that, I thank Caitlin Connolly, who is here tonight, and you'll see some of her work on the walls here. And I'm just really grateful. Uh, that, that she's doing the kind of work that yeah. really puts into images the kinds of feelings that I was trying to evoke in this work. Um, and last but not least, if I won't look at it, because I'll cry, my husband's here tonight, and um, a number of people have asked me, you know, how did you do this with being a working mom? And uh, the answer is that from January to April, my husband took our kids all day on Saturdays. Um, and I wrote then, and from 9 to 11 in the evening, when he was getting, getting to watch Parks and Recreation. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, I um, So truly, he, he made this, this happen, and I'm so grateful for him and for the support that he's shown me throughout our life together. Um, I just want to... Uh, I just want to um, reiterate something that I hope really comes through in the book, which is um, the sense of personal inevitability that I feel from this work. Um, I, I, I did a podcast earlier today, and so it's kind of on my mind, but I, I felt growing up that there had to be some reason why I was raised in this very unusual circumstance. And, and as Carly mentioned, we had lunch at Planet Hollywood together when we were 17. Very random. <laughs> but I was a New York City kid who um, was on the Upper West Side and was the only child of a very devout mother and a less devout, non devout father. And um, I grew up understanding that I was culturally bilingual. I was very aware of it from a very early age. I could speak world, and I could speak church. And this was partly because um, my mother was a, a public figure in the church as an opera singer. And she was um, a, a non-Temple married mother of an inactive man with one child and an international career in the 1980s. Not your stereotypical Mormon woman. But in my experience, those conditions only served to elevate her in her ability to contribute at church. And so I grew up feeling so proud of my mom's ability to contribute to the church organization in a really positive way. And from the time that I was aware of this unique circumstance in which I was bridging these two worlds, I had one prayer, and that was... Father, use me. There's got to be some reason that I had this this upbringing, this unique upbringing. And um, but I am so grateful that my membership in this church has allowed me to become who I am today, and that I am who I am because of the gospel and not in spite of it. And that I am now in an opportunity and have a position to try and um, bring some of that. Um, that, that wonderful, nurturing, um, fantastically in, enlivening truth that I've found in my membership in the church to some other women uh, in this organization as well. So thank you again for being here tonight, for really making me feel at this, at this moment um, our, the true desire that so many of us feel, which is truly to contribute in a positive way to the thing that we love. So thank you.
take a few questions. Yeah. Christian. Hi. Hi. Uh, so you know, it's been said that um, without Malcolm X, uh, there would never have been a lunch And I, I think I want panelist answers for you. But could this possibly have blossomed like it did with the promises to without the actions of Kate Kelly and Lord England and, and, and the, the organism, the, 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 this predecessor of the two And I'm curious what the panel would say. I would say what Kate Kelly, what ordained women, the questions that they have um, asked the um, courage that they have exhibited, the discomfort that they have created, yes. have all contributed to um, greater discussion, and that has, been, for many people, um, brought to the forefront that there is something that is has not been addressed among many women. Um, that I think does make a difference that this coming out exactly what it does will find much more interest because people now realize there are some women who are hurting and men who are hurting I think as well so I think I, I would say it has contributed tremendously I, I also think it's important to um, to mention that there uh, we can say that women and men are hurting, and I think that's absolutely true. I mean, I, I, I feel like I, my personal story illustrates that. But also that this is the right thing to do. I, I, if there, um, we talk about that too. You talk about that in the book. It's, it's, a, it's to bring women to the forefront of our religion and, and allow them to be, to be seen and visible is the right thing to do. And, and I think the same thing like Martin Luther King would say in his letter to, in the Birmingham jail, that this is, this is, this is the right thing to do. So yes, I, I, I'm, you're not the Malcolm, the Malcolm X, I guess I'm. <laughs> <laughs> but I, yeah, I totally agree with the Mel. That, that we, we have, we, um, we're now looking at two different ways to approach this. And um, they're both really important. I think there's probably a corollary, or possibly a corollary in historical writings. Mormonism, where you have people like Jim Allen, uh, publications like Mormon Enigma, MAL Mormon Enigma, uh, Richard and Claudia Bushman, where they're pushing the envelope of what is acceptable in historical writings. And as a result of that, now you have the institutional church uh, endorsing publications and opening vaults that were not open before. Massacre of Mount Meadows is a good case in point. Joseph Smith Papers is another fairly large and significant case in point. And so uh, I think there are people and places at particular times that enact change. I, I wrote down a, a statement from Gandhi coming here just because it fit in my estimation. Gandhi said, in a gentle way, you can shake the world. There are different ways to shake the world. And so the, the balance here is that you are dealing with a hierarchical institution. This is not Protestantism. And Nalen has articulated change that acknowledges that hierarchy, priesthood keys, and so forth. So while Kate Kelly and others that are very, very sympathetic or wholeheartedly follow uh, her expressions and feelings, there may not be um, that identity with institutional church. There's there's certain feelings associated with it and expressions that are more Protestant, if you will, than hierarchical. And I think that's a very important balance that Nathan has struck. And to me, that's a key 
in the trajectory where this discussion can go. Because we were kind of left with the balance. Okay, will this take us that direction? Really? It's either priesthood or excommunication. And this book is saying, oh well, no, there are other alternatives. And, uh, and so I think it's a critical moment. But I think this this book will be able to see those other alternatives Correct. more clearly because of the questions asked through ordained men. I agree. So just to, um, to give you a little insight into the writing of the book. So um, I decided to write the book in December. I started in January and I submitted the manuscript to Brad and Lloyd, I think on June 2nd. Uh, if that was the date, I don't, I think it was, but it was, it, it was two weeks before, uh, there was any noise about Kate getting called to her disciplinary council. It wasn't even on the pub, on the pub, in the public consciousness when I submitted the manuscript. Um, the bulk of the manuscript was written before they even did their second, uh, priesthood session. Demonstration. <laughs> it's not a protest. I knew I knew I knew it was not a protest. I knew that was a event. 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 Um, and you know, so from my point of view, I, I have to see that as, as pretty providential timing. Uh, but but I think it was also really critical for me in the perspective I was writing from because I wasn't trying to answer anything that had happened to Kate or Dave Right? I was I was really writing it in its own its own bubble so that it wasn't an answer to OW or the events or to Kate herself. Um, I actually haven't even met Kate personally. I've crossed airwaves with her um, a couple of times. But um, so so that that that's really important to me because I think it feel I feel I feel like in I in no way was trying to answer her movement or set myself up as any sort of um, foil to her or <laughs> alternative to her. Um, but you know that said, I I've heard the Malcolm X MLK comparison before, and and it's um, it's interesting to me. I think that another thing to keep in mind, though, is that uh, what works in social activist movements, which is definitely you know that we see that dynamic playing out in women's suffrage and civil rights and a number of other movements. Um, I'm just hesitant to overlay that same model onto church cultural change simply because the institution we're working with, if you look at it as a government or a corporation, that I don't think is necessarily going to lead you down a path of success simply because the institution is so, so different. Um, we, we talk about it being a do-it-yourself church, and I firmly believe that it, that it is, but on, on, and on the one level, it is very democratic, but essentially it's, you know, we do believe that Christ is at the helm of this church and we're led by a prophet. And so I think if you overlay social activist, um, a, you know, approaches, then it ultimately is going to not take into account those very unique organizational elements. Um, and the third thing I would say is um, that this, I hope, is simply my handing all of these thoughts over <clears throat> to you as members and saying, okay, you know, let's do this together because this is not the Nyla McBain movement. Um, you know, and, and, and it, it was, has never been intended to be, and I don't think it, it will, will be, hopefully it will not be. Um, it will be, the movement of all of us, because that's the only way culture is going to change. We're going to create new culture, uh, and that can only happen if people start sharing their stories uh, through womenatchurch.com and just you know in in board blogs or or just through more active word of mouth uh, communication. But it's it's sort of a handing over to the people at this point, um, and it's something that we can all we all need to work on together. I think you did a good job of affirming that while there are many women in pain, there are also many women that aren't in pain. Absolutely. And frequently those women, I'm told, <laughs> uh, 
are not acknowledged in these discussions. And in your book, you acknowledge that group of women consistently and give them respect. And uh, that, I think, is significant. First off, I just wanted to say thank you. The days are a couple of months for a lot of us, and I probably speak for not just myself, but this is one of the first things that's given me hope in a long time. So thank you. Um, secondly, I just wanted to ask your opinion. Something that I didn't, um, that I was hoping actually there was going to be a little bit more about the book. Uh, by the way, I stayed up all night last night to read this. All night long, I haven't slept, sorry. I'm going to cry all day to my husband. <laughs> uh, yeah. But, um, yeah, I just, I had to read it before I came here today, but such a wonderful book, so helpful, and one of the things that I thought was so key that you talked about um, was focusing on the target audience of the women who are struggling with these issues and who need to feel more visible and more utilized and more understood. How does, how do priesthood leaders, how do members, how do people find those women? How do they identify them? Because I see that everybody's really scared right now. No one wants to talk. No one wants to raise their hand and say, I support avoiding women or you know, whatever it is. So how do we reach out to those other women and men who might be in that situation in our boards and our states and our families, but at the same time being sensitive to the fact that and we've just really struggled with this in our, we're from Chicago, we're just here randomly, basically, for the day. And, um, you know, we don't want to introduce concerns and doubts to people that don't have them. But how do you, how do you zero in on that target off, off audience and just what would you recommend in that respect? Do you want to ask me? No, it's all you. <laughs> I, yeah, I guess, um, the other day, I was in my backyard, and I was just kind of contemplating these thoughts. It's been some dark months for me, too. Um, and and I I just had this realization that I I happen to be one of those women who like to lead. I, I Maybe, perhaps, I like to hear the, the sound of my own voice. I don't know. I'm not sure what it is, but I, I have to own up to that. And I think that there's this. I've always been battling this desire to just stay back in the shadows and be kind of quiet and hope that somebody notices me. But um, being able to just stand up and say, well, I'd like to be a leader. I, I, I've been able to be in, in um, all the presidencies in, you know, that women are, that are available to women in, in, at the board level. And I've loved it. I've, I enjoy being part of it. And um, so my answer to these questions is always the same, and that is to share your own story. So if, so if you're one of these women, like I am, let's share our stories, and hopefully that will give other people the courage to, to share their stories. In our ward, I, I, um, I heard Ali Ison say to Kate Kelly that our Relief Society is the place where we should be able to feel comfortable talking about our questions. I know. I was like, no way. There's no way. I right now. I'm currently in um, my relief site presidency, and it just happened to be my month to give the lesson. And I was like, okay, Ali, I so I'm going to do it. If you said that this is the place, then I'm going to do it. And I got up and I talked about my my struggles, and um, and it was really really scary, but afterwards I was really grateful that women came up to me and said, I don't share your same perspective, I don't have these same problems, but I'm so glad that I have a face now to, to, to put in my head when I hear women are struggling with, with, the, with ordained women or, um, you know, whatever it is, inequality in the church. Now I can say, oh, that's Courtney, and I like Courtney, and well, I don't know. <laughs> that's Courtney, and she's my neighbor, and it's not that, it's not that far removed. And so I, I, I just, that's, that's my answer, is to stand up and say, this is who I am, and, and hopefully that makes it a little bit safer for the next person. So I'll, I'll give you the great truth of through interviewing, or at least reading interviews with 300 women over the past five years. 
Molly Mormon does not exist. I have not found her. And um, there, I, I mean, time and time and time again, I'm surprised by how many people come up to me and say, you know, I just don't feel like I fit in and I just am lonely and I just don't feel like I'm, you know, the, the church is made for me. And, and I just want to turn around and say, you know what? Nobody does. Nobody does. The church is not intended to be everything for everybody. And it's it, so I, that has given me the courage to, to actually speak up because I know inevitably there is somebody in that ward council or there's somebody in that Relief Society or there's somebody in that primary presidency who isn't, you know, isn't feeling like they're being embraced in the way that they want to be. And I think just from hearing, like like Courtney's saying, from hearing those stories over and over and over again, it's just completely obliterated any sense that like, I'm the only one here with a big target on my forehead and everybody else is in some club that I'm not a part of and they all get along and they all feel that sisterly love and here I am over here. It, I just, um, it's given me a lot of courage to just look at a Relief Society and say, wow, there's somebody in here who is uncomfortable or wants to say something. And then when I see the power of that, exactly what, what Courtney's describing, it's really wonderful. For instance, a couple weeks ago, in, uh, I'm, in, I'm in primary now, so I don't get to Relief Society that often, but I was in Relief Society, and there was a, a lesson about um, marriage, and it was ending up being, and there was a list on the blackboard, you know, it was like the world and then the church's definitions of marriage, and it was ending up being very black and white. And... Um, and someone raised her hand, and she just said, "You know, I I, I just admire so many of uh, the marriages of my non-Mormon friends, and there's so much love in them, and they worked on these things together, and I really admire this about them and this about them, and so I'm really uncomfortable with this list on the board." Changed the whole rest of the lesson. This was five minutes into the lesson, so the rest of the lesson was just delightful. And um, I went up to her afterwards, and I just, you know, said, "Thanks so much for having the courage to do that," and and. Um, and I, I really encourage that I think more and more, more of us are saying those kinds of things because that era of everybody just nodding their head and saying, yes, I am just taking in everything and it's every, everything is just, you know, sounding perfect to me, it, 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 that's over. The church is too big for that to happen now. Too many of us are having experiences in other places in the world and in other industries and in other life circumstances for us uh, to, to just assume that everybody's responding the same way to lessons. So... Rebecca, I don't know if that answers your question, but I think it's it's a matter of, you know, the other thing I would say is that comparatively, we have remarkable ability to control what goes on in our Sunday meetings. You know, this was brought home to me after I wrote, wrote the book. I had lunch with my um, college roommate who was raised Catholic in Baltimore, and her mother actually considered going uh, to the, becoming a nun before she got married and had my friend. And um, I was telling my friend about this book, and my friend said, you know, you Mormons don't know how good you have it. I said, my mom was almost going to become a nun. And when she decided not to become a nun, there was no single other outlet for her to ever participate in her Sunday worship again. And I, I, I mean, it just kind of blew my mind. Because you can walk into your bishop's office and you can say, Bishop, I'm uncomfortable because of this reason and this reason and this reason. And, you know... Bishop, he'll hear uh, you. So that's a remarkable gift that we have. Um, I'm sorry, so I'm thinking about the Mormon Church and the
I'll, I'll say, I think the first half of the book, for me, I just kept thinking, this would be so helpful for anyone who is thinking, why are there women that are thinking that way? It, it invites us to get into those hearts and minds and, and lives and understand why and who and what circumstances are occurring that I, for me, it, it seemed, I thought this will be, I want to give this to people who are saying, why are women wanting the priesthood? And it doesn't say you have to join that that same way of thinking, but it helps you to appreciate where they're coming from and think that we can communicate, we can talk, we don't have to agree on everything. We can support them, we can love them, we can communicate with them, and vice versa. I think it was also helpful to see why there would be some women that would be completely content with their current participation in the church. For me, it was the idea that you you can't look at one woman and come with a conclusion about what women need in the church. I love the part where, in any one group, the study that says you need to have at least three women to be able to start to really be representative, and especially if those three women are not all sitting together in in the group. I found that fascinating. As I'm in a faculty with four women now, we've got four women in our faculty. <laughs> and I just want to say, okay, now I'm thinking, don't sit together, you know, spread out, and, and because each one of us really has a different perspective. But that comes through that not all women think the same or are looking for the same thing, but instead of being uncomfortable with that, to try to better understand and support and celebrate the contributions that each perspective brings. I think the first half of that book would be very helpful in stopping people from judging those who think differently or that you cannot previously understand. Thank you, yeah. I, I, I hope that's what comes through, but it's important, to, it's important to emphasize what this book is not, and it is not a sort of defense of ordained women. Um, so the idea of like, Using it as a way to express to those you love why you feel the way you do, it may be too tame um, for really expressing your feeling, but it will. I mean, the idea is that it hopefully will build some bridges. It's been interesting because you know, when you try and walk the middle ground, you make everybody angry, right? <laughs> and I really expected to make everybody angry, but um, so far the response from the more conservative group has been really, really more positive than I thought it would be. And just in the past couple of days, the response, the negative responses have been coming from ordained women supporters who feel like um, it's a cop-out and, you know, it's it, I've lost, we've lost ground that they might have gained. Um, and that and they feel like I'm, I'm kind of trying to distance myself from OW because it's safer that way. And it truly is not intended to be that way at all. It's it, what you have to do when you approach the book is understand the audience. And the audience really, as Camille is saying, was my effort to say to people who don't understand why some women are struggling, these are some of the reasons in very practical, relatable ways. That these, these are some of the reasons. So just going into it, knowing what it is, I think, and who the audience really is, I think is important. But hopefully you could give it to a lot of people and that might help. Yeah, I would so I would suggest buying two copies. <laughs> and then this is I'm serious. How much do I would take two copies, one for myself, and then I would have another one that I let people um, browse. But not I mean, we want to make sure that they buy their own copy, right? But what you do is you just write down their name, like, okay, you have it for two days, and then <laughs> and then they're if they're gonna read it, they're gonna be like, I gotta get this for you know, right? Like we're flooding the earth with that. <laughs> <laughs> but these aren't discussions. No, no they're not discussions. <laughs> I think I have six reasons. Aren't there six reasons? <laughs> Maybe the time in your case, what it was that made you think now? You know, why is now the time to be talking about the priest and 
Yeah. 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 Y